Well, welcome to episode six of Third Person. And in this podcast, we're talking about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. In our first two episodes, we talked about the nature of the Holy Spirit. We talked about important concepts like God is a spirit, yet God has a spirit. And then we've moved in our series to talk about the different works of the Spirit. We've talked about the Spirit in creation, the Spirit in revelation, and so forth. In this episode, we're talking about the Spirit's work in the incarnation. And we want to begin by looking at John chapter 3 in verse number 34. In that verse, Jesus spoke of himself by saying, For he whom God has sent utters the word of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. And Jesus, in John 3, 34, talked about how he, as the truth of God, the word of God, uttered and revealed the word of God, but he also indicated that the Spirit of God had a part to play in all of this. In these words, Jesus revealed how the Holy Spirit of God had a major part to play in his ministry. In our first two lessons, we talked about how there is diversity amongst the Trinity, but there is also unity. There is diversity amongst the Trinity, but there is also unity. So by diversity, we mean to say that each member of the Trinity has a unique and special role to play in God's covenant of redemption, in God's overall program of salvation. But in saying that there is a unity amongst the Trinity, we are talking about the fact that God is one, Deuteronomy 6.4. So although you want to highlight the special nature, the special function or role of each member of the Trinity, you never want to compartmentalize the Trinity in such a way that you divide the Trinity. Now, the Spirit's work in the Incarnation highlights these realities. Indeed, only Jesus is God the Son incarnate. However, we should note that the Spirit had a special and mysterious role to play in the Incarnation. Now, perhaps it's best to start our study by defining what is meant by Incarnation. This word Incarnation is made up of two words in Latin. In Latin, you have two words, in incarne, which speak of an in-the-flesh idea. So when we speak of the incarnation, we're speaking of the in-the-flesh appearing of the God-man, Jesus Christ. Donald McKim, in his Dictionary of Theological Terms, has said that the incarnation is the doctrine that the eternal second person of the Trinity became a human being and assumed flesh. He did this in Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus Christ was the Word made flesh, John 1.14. This doctrine holds that Jesus was one divine person with both a divine and human nature. Now this doctrine is critical to our salvation. In order to have true Christian salvation, we must believe in the Incarnation. We must believe that Jesus was God in flesh. We must believe and embrace this idea that the God-man was fully God and fully man. You see, we needed a man to die for mere humans like us. If Jesus wasn't a man, he couldn't have provided a substitutionary work on behalf of humans like us. But we needed more than a man. We needed a God-man. Because if Jesus wasn't fully God, on top of being fully man, he couldn't have provided a perfect and sufficient substitute for our sins. So this 
doctrine or this teaching or really this reality of the incarnation is integral, critical, fundamental, and foundational to our faith. And we want to see in this study that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, had a big part to play in the incarnation. See, if we want to really know the Spirit, worship the Spirit, and relate to the Spirit, it, it helps to understand His role in the incarnation. Now, interestingly, the prophets foretold of these things. The prophets prophesied that when the God-man, the Messiah, came to earth, the Spirit would have an imprint upon His ministry. In Isaiah 11, 1 through 2, the prophet Isaiah proclaimed, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. So this is all saying that one would come from the line of David, as Jesse was the father of David. And then Isaiah said in Isaiah 11, 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The Spirit here is none other than the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity. Many English translations of the Bible capitalize the term spirit here to indicate Isaiah is talking about more than a spirit in a presence, as in a presence. Instead, Isaiah is talking about the Spirit as a person, the third person, the third person of the Trinity. From the Godhead, we learn God is three in one, and Isaiah here is talking about the Holy Spirit of the living God, the third person of the Trinity. Now, in Isaiah, we would read something similar later. God himself would speak through the prophet and tell of the way in which the Messiah would be moved, animated, empowered by the Holy Spirit. In Isaiah 42, 1, we hear the word of the Lord. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice, or we could say righteousness, to the nations. Now this is all a prophecy of the way the chosen one from Genesis 3.15 would do a work that would have a mighty impact or bearing upon all the nations. The promises of Abraham through Jesus would come true. The Lord would perform a work through the Messiah that would bring blessings and benefits to every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. So we see that the Spirit of God, as promised in Scripture, had a major part to play in the work of the God-man, Jesus, the Messiah. Greg, Al Greg Allison, in his book, Knowing the Holy Spirit, God, Gift, and Guide, has said this, The work of the Holy Spirit would be decisive for the mission of the Messiah. This is a great, really accessible, easy-to-read book that gives great truth about the work of the Holy Spirit. And Allison has rightfully noted that the Spirit of the living God had a big part to play in the mission and ministry of Jesus. Oh, if we want to know the Spirit well, we need to be familiar with these things. Now, in the Bible, in the New Testament, we see a graphic portrayal of the Spirit's presence in the life and ministry of Jesus. Most Gospels give an account of the way Jesus was baptized in order to inaugurate his earthly ministry. Now, Jesus didn't need to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. He was baptized and said, instead to show that he came to do a work to provide forgiveness of sin. And at his baptism, the, the Spirit showed up in a mysterious, profound, and picturesque way. In Mark 1 and 9, Mark 1, 9, we read, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee 
and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Now, we should know a couple things from Mark's account. First of all, notice the presence of the Trinity in Jesus' baptism. This is a reminder for us that all three persons of the Trinity have a role to play in God's program of redemption. We can see God the Father as the administrator, God the Son as the accomplisher, and God the Spirit as the applier. God is the sovereign, the Son is the sacri- God the Father is the sovereign. God the Son is the sacrifice, and the Spirit is the sealer. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, in God's work of redemption. So we see the presence of the Trinity in these verses, but notice the unique way to which Mark speaks of the presence of the Spirit at Jesus' baptism. He says that the Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove. Now notice a key word there, like. Mark is using what we call in English a simile. He is drawing a comparison using like or as. This tells us that the Spirit did not become a literal dove at Jesus' baptism. Mark is just intending to describe what he saw with what words he has available or what concepts he has available. He sees a mysterious, mighty, majestic, miraculous outpouring of the Spirit upon Jesus. And he sees the Spirit descend upon Jesus in some way that is observable to the human eye. And he compares this to the appearance of a dove. Why? Is it because the Spirit actually looked like a dove? Well, perhaps we see here a reference to a work of the Spirit we saw earlier in our study. In Genesis chapter 9, I believe verse number 18 or maybe verse number 8, at the flood incident, Moses sent out a dove. And this dove was instrumental in the Lord's recreation of the earth after the flood. Now we see Mark indicating that the Spirit had an instrumental work to play in the life and work of Jesus, a life and a work that was intended to secure a sort of recreation for our souls. So we see the Spirit as a major part to play in the incarnation, in the life and work of Jesus. Stephen Wellam, in his book, God the Son Incarnate, has said, to understand our Lord Jesus Christ rightly is to understand the heart of our triune God's plan. So let's remember, in God's plan of salvation, all three members of the Trinity have a part to play. And we see the Spirit coming upon Jesus at His baptism, indicating that the Spirit had a role in Jesus' life and ministry. Now, for the rest of our study on the Incarnation and the Spirit's work in the Incarnation, we want to consider five ways in which the Spirit aided and assisted Jesus in His Incarnation. Number one, let's think about the virgin birth of Christ. The virgin birth of Christ. Now this is another doctrine that is essential to the Christian faith. It is another doctrine that accentuates the 100% God, 100% man nature of Jesus. Jesus was 100% man because he was born of a woman. But Jesus was 100% God because he had no earthly father. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit through a virgin woman, a virgin young girl. 
In Matthew 1, 18, we read the Lord telling us this through his word. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. The original Greek literally reads out of, out of the Holy Spirit. This is the doctrine of the virgin birth, and we see that the Spirit had a role to play in Jesus being born of a virgin. Luke's Gospel tells us of the same things, and Luke, in telling us of these things, shares of how an angel made an announcement concerning the virgin birth. In Luke 1.35, we read of an angel telling Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So we see that the, the virgin birth made it to where Jesus would be the Son of God. The virgin birth assured Jesus' divine and human nature. Notice Luke's language. He speaks of the Spirit overshadowing, overshadowing Mary. This is language that harkens back to Genesis 1-2, where at creation, the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the waters. And this is language again from Genesis 9. We talked earlier about the dove being sent out by Noah at the flood incident. But in, in Genesis 9, we also read of the breath of God, the Spirit of God, we believe, hovering over the surface of the waters once again during the flood incident. So the Spirit of God was there at creation. The Spirit of God was there at the recreation after the flood. And the Spirit of God overshadowed Mary to secure our recreation. Although we are marked and marred by sin, and subject to all of sin's consequences, the uttermost of which is death, the work of the Spirit in the virgin birth secured a recreation so that we can be forgiven of sins and dwell forever with the eternal life of God. So we want to see that the Spirit had a work in the virgin birth. Ed Glascock in his commentary on Matthew in the Moody Commentary series, has said, It should not be strange to us to think of God's placing in Mary's uterus the biological elements for producing the body of our Lord. Well, it may seem strange in a sense that something like a virgin birth could happen, but if God is creator and he created all things, Doing what Ed Glascock just said is not an impossibility. If he could make the sun, the moon, the stars, the cycles of the earth's harvest, he can indeed accomplish the virgin birth. And praise be to the Spirit for his, his work in these matters. As we worship him and relate to him, may we know the Spirit as the Spirit who came upon Mary and accomplish the virgin birth to produce the God-man who would bring about our salvation. So we see his work in the virgin birth. We also see his work in the ministry and miracles of Jesus. We could say much about the ministry and miracles of Jesus. We could speak of how Jesus' ministry involved mighty signs and wonders. And we could speak of how such miracles demonstrated his divine nature. Jesus performed miracles over the created realm, nature, walking on water, speaking to waves. This demonstrated he was creator God. Jesus performed works over the spirit realm, casting out demons. This demonstrated that Jesus was the one who has a name above every name, and he has power over the spirit realm. Jesus also often healed physical bodies. This showed him to be a compassionate 
suffering servant and Lord, but this also demonstrated that he came to perform a work of spiritual healing for God's people. In Acts chapter 10, Paul spoke, or excuse me, Peter spoke about the miracles of Jesus, and he attributed these things to the Holy Spirit. In Acts 10, 38, he spoke of how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he spoke of how Jesus went about doing good and healing all. Matthew also gave testament to the way the Spirit empowered Jesus for salvation. He spoke of the way religious leaders in Jesus' day accused Jesus of being demon-possessed. They said, you perform these mighty works through the power of Beelzebub. And Jesus corrected his contradictors in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 28 by saying, if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And Jesus' if statement shouldn't be regarded as a statement of ambiguity and doubt. Instead, Jesus' if statement should be regarded more like a sense statement. Jesus was saying, since I do these things by the power of God, you can be assured that the kingdom of God is amongst you. Jesus attributed his miraculous works to the Holy Spirit of God. Greg Allison in this book, again, he notes, the Holy Spirit did not only inaugurate the eternal Son existence as the incarnate Son, the Spirit also filled the God-man with His presence and power throughout Jesus' earthly life and ministry. Oh, praise be to the Spirit. May we know Him better. May we refuse to relegate Him to an inferior rank within the Godhead. May we see Him as the one who accomplished the virgin birth and as the one who empowered Jesus throughout Jesus' ministry and in all of Jesus' miracles. Number three, let's talk about how the Spirit anointed Jesus and empowered Jesus for Jesus' preaching ministry. When the prophets foretold of the way the Messiah would come to earth and minister amongst humanity, they often depicted the Spirit as moving upon Jesus to preach and to prophesy in reference to God's truth. Jesus would speak of this himself when he called himself the truth, John 14, 6. Hosea, in Hosea chapter 12, spoke of the way all the prophets of God speak by the Spirit of God. And indeed, as Jesus preached and prophesied as he was upon the earth, he did so underneath the inspiration and influence of the Holy Spirit. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 61 said this, giving voice to the Messiah, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Jesus in Luke 4, 16-19 would plainly state that He was the fulfillment of such prophecy. Jesus was a prophet like none other. Sure, He was the God-man, Son of God, Son of Man, but he was also the ultimate prophet in all of human history. You see, the Bible, as early as Deuteronomy 18.15, had foretold that the Messiah would be a prophet. When we think of prophecy, we can think of it in two senses. There is prophecy that is foretelling, that is, telling the future in advance, telling the future as if it's history, and Jesus did that while he was on the earth. Read Mark 13. He told of the destruction of Jerusalem, the coming of man, the invasion of Jerusalem at the hands of Titus. In A.D. 70, he foretold of the destruction of the Jewish temple and of the way the Lord would pass from moving primarily amongst the Jews to move amongst the Gentile nation. You can think of prophecy in the sense of foretelling, but you can also think of prophecy in the sense of foretelling. That is, delivering, relaying, proclaiming, 
and preaching the propositional truth of God to God's people. Read Matthew 5 through 7. Matthew chapters 5 through chapter 7. And you will get an account of Jesus foretelling the plain principles and propositional truth of God. So Jesus was a prophet unlike any other. And Isaiah 61 informs us that as Jesus prophesied and preached, the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, moved him to prophesy and preach. So may we have an accurate view of the Spirit. May we worship him and regard him, ascribe worth to him. May we seek after his truth, recognizing that the Spirit is the Spirit of truth. Well, we've seen the Lord's work in the virgin birth. We've seen His work in the ministry and miracles of Jesus. We've seen His work in the preaching and prophecy of Jesus. Let's consider also, number four, the work of the Spirit in the cross of Jesus. The author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, told of the way the Spirit of the living God was with Jesus as He offered up Himself as a sacrifice for sins. There, the author of Hebrews said that Jesus, through the eternal Spirit, offered Himself without blemish to God to to purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We shouldn't think of Jesus as being all alone and isolated and without help as he prayed in Gethsemane. We shouldn't think of him as being in dark isolation as he was scourged and beaten by Roman soldiers. As he walked the Via Della Rosa, the Spirit of God was with him. As his hands were pierced on an old rugged cross, the third person was there comforting and undergirding him. As that cross was hoisted up before others, the wonderful person, the Comforter, was with Jesus Christ. Even in His darkest hour, the Spirit was there aiding Him and abetting Him as He offered up Himself as a sacrifice for sins. Oh, the Spirit is so much more marvelous, so much more wondrous than many Christians realize. The Spirit of Christ was with Jesus at the cross of Christ. Lastly, we can think of the Spirit as being with Jesus in His resurrection. In Romans chapter 8, Paul talked about the Spirit, and he said this, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Oh, how wonderful the Spirit is. He's done a work that is greater than many realize. He had a powerful part to play in all the ministry of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the crucifixion and cross of Jesus. And as Jesus' body was there, lifeless in a borrowed tomb, the same Spirit that hovered over the surface of the waters hovered over the lifeless corpse of the God-man. And that Spirit on Sunday morning, resurrection morning, the first Easter we might call it, brought life to lifeless limbs, brought life to lifeless lungs. Jesus was raised because of the work of the Spirit. And we now stand in awe and wonder of the Spirit, and all our hope is in Him, that at the end of time, as Paul said, in Romans 8, 11, the same Spirit that raised Jesus will also raise our bodies to live forever in the new heaven and the new earth. Oh, I hope you really know the Spirit. I hope you really regard the Spirit. I hope you have a life-changing reverence of the Spirit. I hope you are relating to the Spirit. Recognize the Spirit is indeed wonderful and powerful and personal, and we see all of this through the way He worked in the Incarnation.